Open your Bible to the book of John, chapter 19. And we're going to look at verses 31 on down to 37. And like I stated, the title of my message is The, Pl- the, the Blood Still Has Power. Watch this, y'all. Jesus has died. And it says in verse 31, Therefore, because it was the preparation day, that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has has seen has testified And his testimony is true. This is John talking about himself. And he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. You know, one of the things that we, we cited last week is, and well... We cited the last couple weeks, basically, is the foundation of the throne of God is justice or righteousness and justice. And mercy and truth go before his face. Okay, the foundation of God's thrones, he is declared, Psalm 89, verse 14, that righteousness and justice is the foundation of his throne. And he says, in mercy and truth, go before his face. Um, Realize this moment right here is such a powerful moment. Because Jesus is the propitiation. He is the price that was necessary, the price that was given to appease God's wrath towards us. God is just. So he has to deal with sin. He has to deal with it. But he... In his infinite wisdom and his love and his mercy towards us, he sent forth the word made flesh, Jesus, who dwelt among us. And he stood in the gap for us and paid the price that we should have paid for our sin. But God in his justice, righteousness, mercy, truth... He steps in and he gives us the opportunity, quite frankly, that we did not deserve. We need Jesus in our lives. Amen? And so what happens is we see that Jesus, he did not ascend before God our Father and his throne without bringing blood. But it wasn't the blood of a ram or a goat or a bull. It was his own blood. That was brought before the throne of God to appease God's wrath for the transgressions of mankind. And he has become our kinsman redeemer. And for all of us, we have to make sure that we we constantly, this passage of scripture here is so beautiful. That he shed his blood for us. He died on the cross for us to give humanity another opportunity. And an opportunity to receive redemption. And all the other things that God has in store for us. And, and one of the main things is, is what I just stated, is redemption. The blood still has power. The blood gives us an opportunity to receive redemption in our lives. Can I have an amen? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1, verse 7 to 10. Verse 7 to 10. It says here in verse 7, 
In him, we have what? Redemption. Through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence. And having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, and then it says, in him. So the Lord, through the power of his blood, has granted us redemption. To be, to be redeemed means to be let go or freed for a ransom. But he was the one who paid the price. It means, to, it means deliverance on account of the ransom paid. Now, For some people, this is the great problem. They don't realize that before you were in Christ and before you gave your life to Christ, you had been taken captive and were in bondage and didn't even know it. Number one, all of us were in bondage to the hand of the devil. Satan is a real person. He's a real personality. He is someone, and we have to understand this, who understands human nature. He has been deceiving people from the beginning of time. So so if you think that you can get away from him in your own power, you are sadly mistaken. It took someone greater than than him to free you from his captivity. The devil comes into people's lives And he wants to kill, steal, and destroy your life. He wants to take you out. And the thing that is so interesting is he does it in a way in which, in which, and I and I have to say this because we have to be respectful of our opponent because he is a formidable opponent. Um, He does it in such a deceptive way that we don't even realize that he's doing it. He wants to get people ensnared in all kinds of bondages and addictions. And he wants to hold people captive to a faulty mindset that keeps them enslaved to his lies. He is the father of lies. Jesus comes on the scene and he begins to shine the light on this hidden figure that has been destroying humans for for, for centuries. And he does exactly that. And then he dies, as we've seen, and he brings redemption towards us. He frees us from his slavery and bondage. He he breaks the chains that kept us bound and the mindsets that keep us bound to the enemy's influences. And so we have to see, number one, that he redeems us. He snatches us out of the hands of the enemy. He buys us back. He purchases us back. And he frees us from the enemy's hand. Stop thinking. Now, I just got to say this. Stop thinking if you leave the devil alone, he'll leave you alone. You got to know who your enemy is. And your enemy isn't your boss or your spouse or your this. For we, 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 for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the what? Flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. And so we have to realize that we're fighting of an invisible kingdom that's trying to press us in the bondage and keep people captive. And he wants to keep people captive even while they go to church. Jesus came along to redeem us, to buy us back, to free us. And it was his blood that was price that was paid and his life that was the price that was paid to bring us back into a relationship with God. We have to see this. Number two is the world. The world has a system that is designed to bring people into captivity and my, primarily captivity in their thoughts. The enemy, Satan himself, has 
has the world going down a certain path. And he wants all of us to jump into this same stream and flow in the same mindset and flow in the same way. Jesus came on the scene and he was countercultural. He broke the norms and he began to reveal the kingdom of God. And so the world wants to pressure us and to constantly pressure us into being and doing what the world is doing. And the enemy is behind the scenes pushing this narrative. We have to be able to see that we are in the world, but we are not what? Of the world. That we're not of the world. And it doesn't mean that you can't enjoy your life and enjoy the world and enjoy the planet and enjoy all that God has placed in store for us freely to enjoy. But when the enemy starts to get you to start to think like him, you have to pause. Stop jumping on every bandwagon that you see on television. And every bandwagon that you see on the internet or in your social media, don't ride every bus that comes your way. Can I have an amen? Because some buses are heading in the wrong direction. And so all of us, we have to see that the world is going down a way. And I love Pastor James Davis because he would tell us. He says, son, you have to be like the salmon. You have to swim upstream. And I never forgot that. He would always tell you, you have to be like the salmon. The world is going to try to get you going down this direction. You got to swim upstream. And swimming upstream is harder And it takes more. And sometimes you have some lonely days. And sometimes you fall out of favor with certain people because they want you to jump on the same. But you got to keep swimming against the current. Can I have an amen? You got to keep swimming against the current and swimming against the current because the enemy wants everybody going. But Jesus, he redeemed us from the influence and the power of the world. And the last thing we have to see here is that he redeemed us from our flesh or from sin. Our old sinful nature had us in bondage and captivity. You don't have to teach people to sin. It just starts coming out of them because our nature was flawed. Well, our flesh can get the best of us. Well, Jesus died to break the power of the flesh over our life. He he wants us to walk in the spirit so that we do not fulfill the lust of our flesh. He teaches us how to defeat the enemy in us. The old Adam in us that wants to still rule. But Jesus comes in and he says, I'm the ruler now in here. Can I have an amen? And I give you power to overcome your flesh and overcome addictions and bondage and overcome these things. And Jesus redeems us from the power and the influence of our flesh. This is what the blood does. He does this through the power of his blood. And we have to be willing to receive this and understand the beauty of this. That, man, I don't owe the devil anything. I don't owe the world anything. I don't owe my flesh anything. Flesh, you do not rule in here because there is a new master that lives on the inside. Can I have an amen, y'all? I think that's something to shout about a little bit. Man. In him we have redemption through his blood. And then he says this, and this is point number two. He says forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins. To forgive, it means to release from oneself or from someone else. To release from oneself or someone else. It it is tied to debt release. It means to free you. And I think that for us it's important that we see that it's the blood of Jesus that gives us access to the forgiveness of sins. This is what frees you. And the forgiveness of sins and then also the cleansing of your conscience. Let's face it, all of us, all of us have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. There's no one in this room that is perfect or has been perfect in your life. Jesus died. He died so that we might experience the forgiveness of sin. You know, so many people are burned down and bogged down with their sin. This is where a lot of the depression comes from. 
A lot of the depression comes from and a lot of discouragement and a lot of the stuff that people face in life in terms of heaviness in their lives is tied to the fact that they haven't dealt with the sin issue. So you can pop as many pills as you want. But until we repent of our sin, we'll never experience the freedom of the forgiveness of sins that God is trying to release in our life. And this is what happened. You see, and and I love this because, um, you know, Cain and Abel had this, this issue. Abel offers the sacrifice that's pleasing to God. Cain He doesn't. And then when God disciplines him, he basically tells him, if you do well, will you not be accepted? Just do what's right. And you're going to feel better about yourself because he turned away and his countenance had fallen. The Hebrews, when you look at this in the Hebrew, it, it literally means that he got depressed. And what happens to a lot of people because their relationship with God isn't right. They struggle with certain things and heaviness and all this. They're bogged down and burned down. And this heavy load is on them because they haven't made it right with God. So you can drink as much as you want, but it's not going to take away the burden. You can, you can take as many drugs as you want. It's not going to take it. You can buy this and buy that and, and sleep with him and sleep with her and, and do all these things. But it's never going to take away the burden. It's the power of the blood of Jesus that helps to give us access to forgiveness and then that liberates the burden from us. The shame and the guilt of our past. It's the power of the forgiveness that comes as a result of the blood of Jesus that God wants to release into our lives so that we can experience freedom. We sing about freedom. But that's freedom when you know that, man, I have been forgiven. That the Lord shed his blood. I have received Jesus by faith, repented of my sin, and now I have the forgiveness of sin through the power of his shed blood. And I'm free. I'm free. That my past doesn't have me bound. That I'm not always thinking about what I used to do. And when the devil comes along and tries to remind me of what I used to do, then I can remind him that the power of the blood is still working in my, can I have an amen? That the blood, it still has power in my life. That you have something to fight the enemy back with. And it's the power of the blood of Jesus. That we experience freedom. To, it, that my sin has been let go of, it has let go of me. It has let go of me. That when you forgive someone else, you're letting it go. You're releasing them and releasing yourself. That no longer am I captive to my past. No longer am I riddled with shame and guilt. What happens is we have to know this because the devil is still going to try to bring accusation against you. You ain't nothing. You just went to church a couple times. You're not doing nothing. You're not right. You're still not right. And the enemy will come along and he'll try to bring such accusation. The Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. Try to accuse you. And what happens is we have to know what the blood has done for us. So when you look at your past, you know that God has freed me from the sin of my past. And you know how you really free when you can talk about it. Man, I was a low down dirty rat. Man, I was so bad. Oh, my goodness, I was so bad. And you can talk about it freely knowing that God has taken all your sin and put, in the, put them in the sea of forgetfulness. That you don't look at, you don't look at your past. Now, that we shouldn't be glorifying our past. Let me throw that in there. But at the same time, that we're not held captive to our past because of the power of the blood. How many grateful about that? Get that weight off you. Let's go to Romans chapter 5. Look at this. Romans chapter 5. So we see redemption. We see forgiveness of sin through the power of the blood of Jesus. One of the things that I talk about a lot here is the word justification. That we're justified. That we are justified. 
is just as if I'd never sinned. It's just as if I'd never sinned. That God has justified me. This word justification, it means to be freed from blame, to be declared righteous. That he frees us from all blame and declares us righteous in his sight. Look at verse 6. Romans chapter 5, verse 6. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love towards us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by his what? Blood. We shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in Christ and rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. So one of the things that we have to see is, Declaration, God declares you something before you actually become it experientially. This is beautiful thing about, about what God does. I'm saved. I'm being saved. I will be saved. I'm saved. God has declared me righteous and justified me through the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. But then this righteousness that God declares, he wants it to be lived out in my life. He doesn't want me just to be declared it, but then never live it. He declares it, and then he starts to work out. The Bible says, work out your own soul salvation through fear and trembling. So we have to work it out. There's something that God is working. You're on the potter's wheel, and you're not made in a day. Can I have an amen? God justifies you. He declares you righteous, declares you right. He frees you from all blame, and then he gets to work on you. He starts to make you who he wants you to be from the inside out. He starts to process you. He starts to break you. He starts to prepare you. He starts to stretch you. He starts to get us to acknowledge areas in our lives where we are falling short and we're not hitting the mark. He starts to convict us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he teaches us how to live a lifestyle of repentance. That if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So he continues. And so this is a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. The Holy Spirit convicts you. And then you say, God, I ask that you forgive me, wash me, cleanse me. I repent. I turn away from that. And then the blood just continues just to flow. Can I have an amen, y'all? The blood just continues just to flow. And it still, his power is still working in your life as God is working on you. He's declared you something, but now he's making you something. He wants you to be a Christian. He wants you to be like Christ. He wants you to live like him. And so he starts to work on you from the inside out. And this is a process. Look at your neighbor and tell him this is a process. But it's a beautiful process. Sometimes the process, is, it stings. Sometimes it's painful as you're going through this process when you know God's trying to kill something in you because he's justified you, but now he's making you righteous, and he has to kill something in you. And sometimes that hurts. It's painful when you're looking up and you're thinking you're better than you really were. (laughs) Can I have an amen? I thought I was, I thought I was, oh, God, here I am again. You thought you had made it. You was prophesying, casting out devils, walking on water, healing the sick, traveling, and all of a sudden God showed you, but you got a, you got a blind spot right here. You still got some junk I need to work on right now. I got to get this out of your life. You can preach, you can sing, you can do this, you can do that, but you still, this is an area I got to get it out of you. I got to get it out of you. Can I have an amen? And then God takes us, and that process sometimes can be painful when you wake up and you look in the mirror and say, God, it is me still standing in the need of prayer that I need help in my life. And I preach to nations, and I've been here, and I've done this, and I've done that, and I've done this, but God, I still, you got to break this in me that I, come on now. 
Come on now. God's still working on you. The minute that you start thinking you're perfect is the minute that you just fall, just fail. You just fail. God is always working on us. He justifies us. He declares us something, but then he works on you. He starts to get you on the potter's wheel. It's okay. You didn't see this, but let me get it. Let me get this in you. Let me get this in you. Let me get it. But does that mean that I'm still not justified? No, God has justified me. He's freed me from blame of my past. But now that I've got on the other side, there's still more work to do. I'm fighting from a different vantage point. I'm not fighting on this side. I'm fighting on the other side now, and there's power. And now I'm, f- now watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. I'm fighting undercover. I'm fighting undercover. I'm fighting undercover. Now, I'm, God's not mad at me over here as I'm fighting over the devil's covering. Now God is dealing with me over here, but I'm, I'm, I'm covered as he's, as he's fighting for me. Just get it right. Get it right. I got you. I'm not going to let the devil destroy you all the way. I'm not going to let him kill you, but you got to get this out of your life. I'm not going to let him take you out, but you got to. I got you. I got kept. Woo. Woo, my goodness. I got you. I got you. Just stay on the, stay on the wheel. Stay on the wheel. Stay on the wheel. I'm not going to kick you out the house. Mm. I see that right there. I just see that. But God is processing you. And we got to understand that this is part of justification. It's part of it. That I'm justified, but God is making me, but he's making me righteous. And, And he wants me to be, not just be religious. He wants us to be transformed into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ from glory to what? To glory. From glory to glory. So he's taken me. I'm justified. But I'm still being processed. And it's because of the power of the blood of Jesus. And during my process, God has got me covered. Mm, mm, mm. Colossians chapter 1. And we talked about this. A couple weeks ago also, this is number four. So we have redemption, we have forgiveness, we have justification. But this is, this is really good. I love this about the scripture because God, he gives us peace. The blood of Jesus Christ still has power to bring peace into our lives. Colossians chapter 1, verse 19. It says, For it pleased the Father that in him, Jesus, all the fullness should dwell. Talking about this in the Rock School of Ministry, the Godhead. And by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of of his cross, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If, somebody say if. So this is a condition. It's a condition. He says, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, he says, became a minister. He says here, and I love this. He says, and by verse 20, and, and, by, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Peace. Peace with God. Number one, if you want to have peace, and we talked about this in the very beginning, we got to get guilt and shame and stuff off of us and get peace into our lives. And, and you get peace into your life through the blood of Jesus Christ. And your restoration of your relationship with God brings an inherent peace. 
that I am a child of the Most High God. I am no longer an enemy in my mind through wicked works, an enemy in my mind towards God. I am on God's team now. And I have peace with God. God has peace with me. I don't have this, this internal rejection. I have been accepted in the beloved. You know, look, this is the problem. God tells Adam and Eve, he tells them, the day of this, that you eat of this tree, you shall surely die. They did not die physically when they ate the tree. They died spiritually. Their spiritual chamber was shut down, and their ability to communicate with God on that level, on the God level, was, was cut off. And their relationship with God, now there was an ought there that needed to be dealt with. The angel comes to Adam and Eve and drives them out of the Garden of Eden. He said, I don't want you to eat that tree unless you stay in this state for the rest of your life. You're done. The angel comes and he drives them out of that place of peace, that place that God had established for them, and drives them out and basically just rejects them, gets them out. And the last thing that Adam and Eve saw concerning the Garden of Eden was an angel standing there with a flaming sword, keeping them away. Well, the problem that we have as human beings is that same Adam is in all of us. He's in all of us. All of us came from Adam. And in our minds, what happens is this. Subconsciously, in, and inherent within us is rejection. That I have been rejected from God, and I see this flaming sword. And this is why it happens. Some people, they won't come to church. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to do it. I don't want to think, I want to think, you know, God can never forgive me. God can never, I can. And you see this, people walk around with this sense of rejection. Well, when Jesus comes in, what does he do? He breaks down through the power of his blood that rejection and helps us to experience acceptance in him and through him. So that now the middle wall of separation has been torn down and the veil was rent from the top, from the bot to the bottom. So that now we can boldly approach the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. And it's through the power of the blood that now we can approach God. That the flaming sword is no longer there. That we don't have to walk in rejection and walk in the sense of God doesn't love me anymore. Jesus was, came to reveal God our Father's love for us. And what we have to do is learn how to, and I love this, by the power of the blood, accept what God has done for us and receive it and enjoy the peace that is tied to that. I had to get this out of my mind that, wait a minute, you're telling me that through the blood of Jesus that God has given me access to peace with God? Well, I'm not going to act like the flaming sword is still there. The flaming sword has been taken away. And now I can barge right back into the arms of my father. And I can barge right back into a garden relationship with God, the father. And I can experience, can I have an amen? I can experience a little Eden in my life. <laughs> Woo! That God, you're telling me that you're my father? that I have been born again and that, that I don't have to feel rejected anymore, that I have been accepted in the beloved and that you have a place for me and that, Jesus, you died to make me a kingdom citizen and a child of the most high God. I could care less what the devil says, what anybody else says, what anybody else has declared. I don't care who rejects me or who accepts me. All I know that I'm accepted by a great big God who sent his son to die for me and to shed his blood to give me access to some Eden in my life.
<laughs> that God wants to walk with me in the cool of the garden? Come on, y'all. He wants you to, to jump in his arms and receive forgiveness of sins and to enjoy the blessing of God in your life? Stop running from God. And when that, when that in you, inherently within you, tells you, well, I, I can't give to church because I'm not perfect. Well, who up in here is perfect? <laughs> the perfect one is perfecting you. Can I have an amen? The perfect one is perfecting you. Stay on the potter's will. Let him perfect you. But, but get this flaming sword out of your mind and your conscience. And realize that the blood of Jesus came to bring you peace. So I have peace with God. I'm not fighting with God all the time. Wrestling with God. And, and having a relationship with God that's schizophrenic. That's double-minded. That we, that we have a relationship with God that's just, that it's even, and it's, and it's even kill. And it's, 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 a, it's a relationship that is a constant ascension before his throne. And you learn just to live with God, and you have peace with God. And I don't want to do anything to disrupt this peace that I have with God. And so everything else can be going crazy in your life. But if you have peace with God... It's a peace that surpasses all understanding. That's the problem. The problem is that you don't have peace with God. you got to have peace with God first. Stop blaming everybody on your job because you're late. <laughs> Can I have an email, y'all? If I would have been on time, if it wasn't your fault. No, the problem is, is this. We tend to want to blame everybody else. When the issue is, you just don't have peace with God. And what we want to do is, through the blood of Jesus, understand that because the devil is going to constantly try to bring chaos into your life. And confusion. But God is not the author of that confusion in your life. He is the God of peace. He wants to give you peace. And so we have that. And it's through the blood. I thank you that through your blood, Lord, that we have peace with you. This peace also, like I stated a couple weeks ago, it spills over into your relationship with your brothers and sisters. You start to have peace with people. Like you're not always mad at everybody. I don't know how people do it. You're mad at everybody. Everybody don't hate you. Can I have an amen? People are just, are you always fighting with everybody? It's just contentious, fighting all the time because you don't have peace with God. A lot of times people fight with other people because they don't have peace with God. And they always assume and think that it's the other people's problem that's making them not have peace. But it's your relationship with God that's making you not have peace. Stop blaming me for your lack of peace. Can I have an Amen. And what happens is, and then you start, but when you have peace with God, it helps you to have peace with your brothers and sisters and have peace with other people. You want to be a peace, a, a person that is a peacemaker. And you can only be a peacemaker if you're at peace. Can I have an amen? You get around some people, man, they scared of everything. Fidgety all the time. You have peace. You got to have some peace. You ever have, oh, oh, ah. <laughs> like, my goodness. It's, and they don't have no peace. What's the worst thing? What's the worst thing that you can have happen to you? Is that you die and then go right into the presence of Jesus Christ? What you afraid of? I'm not tripping. I know where I'm going. And what happens is when you have peace with God, he settles all of that. And then you have peace with people. You're not looking at everybody suspicious. You have peace. When we can drive in the car together. Just have some peace. Just have, it, and it's, it, it's an internal condition and quality that comes through the power of the blood of Jesus. 
Can I have an amen? And the last thing here is this. Let's go to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Some of y'all stay away from this book. We got to get in here. <laughs> y'all, y'all scared of the book of Revelation. It's good stuff in here. Amen. Stuff we all need to know. Look at this. Revelation chapter 1, verse 4 to 6. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own what? Blood. Who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to God, to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Said we've been washed. We've been washed. I love this. You know, washed speaks of consecration. Consecration means to be set apart and set aside as holy. When Moses and the children of Israel erected the tabernacle of Moses, they had the tabernacle, the outer court, inner court, holy of holies. And everything, all the articles, the table of showbread, the altar of incense, the Ark of the Covenant, um, the golden lampstand. Everything was consecrated with blood. It was sprinkled with blood. It was consecrated and set apart for God's use. Essentially, it was washed. It was set apart. And for us, it's the same thing. When you give your life to God, the blood of Jesus Christ is, is you are, if you will, smeared or washed with the blood. And it is a sign that I have been set apart and consecrated for God, that I belong to God. I don't belong to the world anymore. I don't belong to the devil. And the flesh has no rule in my life. I have been set apart. Well, and then also, remember, when the children of Israel came out of Egyptian captivity, their doorpost was smeared with blood. So when the death angel came, came by, that they could not, the death angel could not touch their homes because they had been set apart. And for us, it's the same thing. We have to see ourselves as individuals that have been washed with the blood. That the blood is a cleansing agent. It comes in and it cleanses our conscience from our dead works. Your conscience needs to be renewed and restored so that your inner law, which is your conscience, your inner law does a good job of accusing you and excusing you. You want to have that inner witness within yourself that accuses you or excuses you when you need to be excused or accused. And the Holy Spirit works with your conscience to bring things forth in your life and to keep you on the straight path. Well, we as believers want to allow the blood of Jesus Christ to work so that our conscience is good. Our conscience is healthy. And it's strong that before, watch this, before the Holy Spirit can get to me, my conscience gets me. My conscience is like, is like the yellow light. My conscience says, slow down. Better watch it. Should I do that? Your conscience, no, that's not good. And then the Holy Spirit sits back and says, hmm, I didn't have to convict them. And now you're, you're becoming healthy. Then as you start to journey forth, what happens is to us is the blood of Jesus Christ begins to wash us and cleanse us. Then our mind starts to get washed. That God begins to renew our minds. And we become renewed in the spirit of our minds. And then now we start to live out the realities of Christ's life within us because we are being washed through the blood of his cross. And, that's, and now you're set apart. You're set apart. People look at you and they say, you're different. I say, yeah. <laughs> I say, yeah, man. What happened? The blood still has power. I say, what happened to you? When I go back to my hometown, 
People look at me like I'm an alien. Dude, what happened to you? I'm covered in the blood. And, what, and God comes in and he begins to wash you and cleanse you. And then you're set apart. Now, man, let's go do this. No, 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 no. Man, remember when we used to go over here? Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that was funny, y'all. Well, what about that? Come on, man. Let's, let's try this. No. No. My consecration has set me apart from things that I know would defile me. Can I have an amen? And bring me back into, to, to, to bring me back into uh, an issue with God. And I don't want any more issues with God. I want God. I want peace with God. I want to maintain this peace. And God begins to wash you and cleanse you. And the things that you used to think were funny, they're not funny anymore. The thing that you used to say you were fun, they're not fun anymore. And the things that, and God comes in and he begins to wash you in the power of his blood. And the blood begins to work in your life and then you start to be washed. It doesn't mean that you don't have a good time. It doesn't mean that you don't have fun in life. It just means that now through the blood, I understand where my dwelling place is and I make sure I don't cross the line or get close to the line. Because I want to maintain this holy place because I have been set apart as a holy vessel for God. Can I have an amen in this place, y'all? That you have been set apart as a holy vessel for God. On your job, you may be the only person that's saved and you're the only vessel that God has there that's there to be a light in the midst of darkness. Stop complaining and crying about everybody. Just be who God called you to be in the midst of the darkness that he placed you. Because everybody needs some light in their life. Can I have an amen? You may be the only person in your family that has been set apart and set aside to God and for God. In your family. And they may not invite you over for Christmas, Mother's Day, Easter. Can I have an amen? Amen. And they may not want you to come over because you think you're too holy. But you don't stop being holy. Can I have an amen? And you don't conform to get to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is a good and acceptable will of, you got to stay set apart. I'm going to stay set apart and do it with a smile on your face. Don't become a mean Christian and bitter and, oh, y'all going to hell, I see it in the spirit. (laughs) You don't jump on that bandwagon either. Can I have an amen? You don't become self-righteous and holier than thou and start puffing out your chest. And thinking that you know everybody, everything and no one else knows anything. You don't become self-righteous. The more that God begins to work on you. Now watch this. The more that God begins to work on you and wash you. It should result in more and more humility. When you see how much junk you really had in your life. So how can I point my finger at somebody else? Look what God is doing in me. This is what should happen. Saints, you know the theme of this year is foundations. If we don't have revelation concerning the blood of Jesus, we don't have a foundation. These truths need to be fixed in us. So when the devil attacks us, we have something to fight back with. When the world tries to pressure us, we have something to fight back with. When your flesh tries to tell you that you're the old you, that you have something to fight back with. And our foundation has to be fixed. We have to know what the blood of Jesus has done for us. That the blood of Jesus has power to bring redemption into our lives. Forgiveness into our lives. Justification in our lives. Peace in our lives. And the ability to be washed comes to us through the power of the blood of Jesus. Well, we have to know this. How can we say we're Christians and we don't even know what redemption means? Or forgiveness is really about or what it means or what justification is. Or what peace with God is and what it does. How can we say we're Christians and we have never allowed God to wash us? We have no foundation. Jesus 
died to give us foundation. And let me remind you once again, we need Jesus, y'all. We need Jesus. And, and as we go forth in our lives, it doesn't matter if you are 10 years old or you are 90 years old in this room. You need the blood of Jesus. And it doesn't matter if you're giving your life to Christ today or you're, if you have given your life to God 50 years ago. You still need the blood of Jesus in your life. It doesn't matter if you are a CEO or a company or you are living out of your car. You need the blood of Jesus in your life. It doesn't matter if you're single in this building or you are married in this room. You need Jesus in your life. It doesn't matter if you are a prophet, a priest, an apostle, an evangelist, or a pastor, or a teacher, or you're someone that just comes here on Sunday morning, or somebody just is, just, uh, is an usher at the front of the building. You need the blood of Jesus in your life. Can I have an amen? It doesn't matter if you walked up in this room and you came with all kinds of baggage. And you're saying to yourself, I don't know what I can do. I'm telling you what you can do. Embrace the power of the blood of Jesus in your life this morning. Because God wants to make you a child of the most high God. And we look up and we see people who are struggling with all kinds of baggage and heaviness and depression and discouragement. My question to you is, have you given your life and made your life right with Jesus? Because that's what you need. If you have peace with God, everything else is going to work itself out. Father, this morning, I thank you that you are going back to the foundation and reminding us how much we need the blood of Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, that your sacrifice on the cross, that moment, John chapter 19, there's such a, a beautiful moment, and it has even more meaning now that we've seen all of these things. When he pierced you in your side, And the blood begin to flow. That blood wasn't for you. That blood mixed with water was for us. Man, I'm just so grateful. Come on, everybody, stand to your feet. You know, don't ever forget where he found you. Don't ever forget it. Jesus didn't have to do any of this for us. And when you die, You're going to realize how special, how special it really was when you have to stand before his throne. Don't ever take it for granted. 
Don't ever take what Jesus did for you for granted. It's such a privilege. Don't take church. Don't take reading your Bible. Don't take, don't take it for granted. Because if the devil could have killed you, he would have did it already. But it was Jesus. Can I have an amen, y'all? Stay grateful. Stay grateful and thankful for the blood of Jesus. This morning, if you're in this room and you're saying, Pastor, I just, that's me. I need God. I need more of God. I, 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 you know, I've been around the church. I've been playing church. I, I know church, but I, 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 want, I want this revelation of the blood, and I need God in my life. And God sent you here this morning. It's a setup because he's drawing you by his loving kindness. He's drawing you to himself because he wants you to experience redemption. He wants you to know the power of justification in your life, and he wants to give you some peace. If God is ministering to you today, I want you to come on down to the altar so we can pray with you. Don't, let you, don't you let the devil stop you from coming up to this, this altar because today is your day. God bless you, sister. God bless you, sister. God bless the sister over here.